Okay. Now I'm going to introduce our two speakers. And first, today we have a distinguished mathematician, Chaim Goodman Strauss, who has spent time chairing the mathematics department here, who is an expert in knot theory. And Chaim studies the matching rule tilings at the intersection of discrete geometry, foundational logic, and theoretical computer science. He's published a key paper in the, in the top journal in the field, The Annals of Mathematics. He has also worked with the recently deceased, fantastically renowned Princeton mathematician, John Conway, and together they worked on mathematical illustrations and sculpture. In fact, on campus, you can come see Hyam's work in Champions Hall and at the Arkansas Research and Technology Park. And then following Hyam's presentation, we have a distinguished professor of geography in our department of geosciences, and also the vice chancellor for research and innovation at the University of Arkansas, Daniel Swee, who had come to the University of Arkansas from a very distinguished career at Ohio State. Dr. Swee is an internationally renowned geographer, and I love his interdisciplinary style which fuses humanistic inquiry, social sciences, and STEM by using geographic information science to solve problems in urban planning, public health, and environmental science. And Dr. Swee has assembled a really impressive team of researchers who are now grappling with this COVID-19 crisis. And in fact, very excitingly, Daniel Swee's presentation today will provide insights into the findings of his research team. So I'm going to take my camera off and mute myself and turn the floor over first to Dr. Goodman Strauss to be followed by Dr. Swee. So take it away, Chaim. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Kuhn and the Honors College and everyone here. Um, my goal to really is fairly modest. I'd like to describe some of the mathematical principles at the root of epidemiology to help us have a sense of really what has been happening, what was happening, and particularly at the beginning of the uh, pandemic and why such urgent measures were needed. Really, it's um, not necessarily intuitive, even understanding mathematically what was going on and uh, just to try to anchor that. But before I begin, I wanna be clear on two points. So first of all, uh, part of the power of mathematics is that it can extract from any from a particular setting and abstract some mathematical principle and then apply it all over the place to a wide variety of applications. And that's certainly uh, the case with some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but in order to illustrate them, some of my examples are going to be a little whimsical. And in no way, and uh, they are, because I want them to be vivid, but in no way is that meant to diminish or neglect the seriousness of the situation. And I wouldn't necessarily have said this, but um, John Conway was a good friend of mine as well, and he died of the COVID virus. So it's real, and it's going to be very real to all of us. And um, even though some of the things I'm going to say are hopefully fun and going to stick with you, um, I'm not meaning to diminish that. And then second of all, mathematics by its very nature is deeply reductionist. In some sense, science is reductionist, but mathematics especially so, where a lot of the messiness is sort of washed away so that we can get to some sort of underlying principles. And, um, but removing some of the sticky real world issues that are essentially impossible to address completely in a mathematically rigorous manner. And so I'm gonna go into some of the basics of modeling, but. Um, I need to be upfront that what I'm basic I'm showing you is essentially epidemiology 101, not even what epidemiology 101. It's the first little tiny bit of that. What I'm going to show you is important and it's real and it underlies all of those ideas, but it's just the very beginning of a highly complex and highly interdisciplinary area. So before I begin, let me show you first. Uh, exponential growth is Oh no, just give me a second. Um, this is exactly what I feared. Now there's my Microsoft Teams seems to have lost the window that I need. So 
So I guess I'm going to just share my desktop and hopefully that you can all see this. So, um, so ex ex the word exponential growth is used quite a bit and um, it's used in a common way, which is absolutely inaccurate and totally unhelpful for our current situation. So, um, so here's an example of something that was called exponential growth. The shocking and really horrific um, unemployment claims week by week uh, last in two months ago, we saw this enormous spike from this uh, historical couple hundred thousand in normal times levels of initial unemployment compensation claims up to what about 300,000 in just just like that. And that's in common common usage is often called exponential growth. And we saw again another tremendous spike and perhaps this might have been exponential growth, but it really isn't because again, um, by the 11th of April, which happens to have been the day that John died, um, the claims were already falling off. And um, what exponential growth is really is that the rate at which something is growing is exactly proportional to the size of whatever's there. So for example, if the rate of growth had continued to spike proportionally to the number of claims that were already that then, well, then we would have exponential growth. Let me give you another example. This is a little whimsical, but it, I think it illustrates it pretty well. So um, I think we're all familiar, or most of us are familiar with the song, The 12 Days of Christmas, and it begins on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. The second day, we get two turtle doves and a partridge in the pear tree, and of course, the three French hens. On the fourth day, we get the four turtle doves, the three French hens, the two turtle, et cetera. Okay. Now the question is, obviously the number of gifts is growing each day by a little bit more, but what is happening with the um, total accumulated enormous pile of gifts that my true love is given to me? By the end of the 12 days of Christmas, I have, I got 10 lords of leaping on the 10th day, I got 10 lords of leaping on the 11th day, and I got 10 lords of leaping on the 12th day, so that's 30 lords of leaping just right there. And I don't know really where you stick 30 lords leaping. Or for example, the, the five rings, you get the five rings on the fifth day, you get five rings again on the sixth day, five rings again. So you get five rings on seven successive days, that's 35 golden rings and so on. So the, you have this enormous accumulated pile of gifts. And I should say, here's a graph of it. Let's see, whoops, here's a graph of it. Let's see if I can um, zoom in properly. Okay, so this is the enormous pile of gifts. And on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me just one thing, this partridge in a pear tree. In the second day of Christmas, I got two turtle doves, and partridge in a pear tree, plus the first partridge in a pear tree. On the third day of Christmas, it was the three French hens, the two turtle doves, the partridge in the pear tree, plus the gifts that I'd gotten on the previous. Now you can see, whoops, what just happened there. Plus you can see, so this is growing quite rapidly and it's like a skyscraper of gifts. If we zoom out, you go all the way out, it's just this enormous tower. And in fact, the progression is kind of interesting. It's uh, on the first day we get, so hang on. So um, how quickly is this actually growing? So on the first day, we get one. On the second day, we have accumulated four. So more than, well, four times as many. On the next day, it's 10. That's, of course, almost twice as many. 20, 35. You see it's going up quite rapidly. One, four, 10, 20, 35. But this is not exponential growth. And in a way, we can see this very clearly because at first it was very impressive how quickly this is growing, right? But by the time we get out here, it's much less impressive. You see that when I get to this stage, even though more gifts have been added than on the previous day, just visually you can see that it's not in proportion to the size of the number of gifts that were there already. 
And that's even less impressive, even though it's more gifts than have been accumulated so far, have been given on any given day up to this point, it's still not in proportion to the total pile of gifts that have been given up to that point. So this is again exam an example of something that's not exponential. This is, uh, it turns out to be the same as the cube of the number of days, or roughly the cube of the number of days. So in other words, if you uh, were to put the gifts into a cubicle size box, roughly speaking, the size of the box would grow exactly with the um, size of the day, with the number of the day. So um, what is exponential growth? Well, this is a famous story. Uh, Dr. Kuhn before, Dean Kuhn before the lecture was saying something about, you know, would a medievalist have something to say about math? Well, this is actually a parable that dates from at least the year 1250 and probably is much older than that. And you've probably heard it. So in reward for service, some somebody or another approached some king or another and was going to be rewarded a single grain of rice, barley, wheat, whichever depends here, rice, for service uh, to be placed on the first square of a chessboard. And on the second square of the chessboard, then there'd be two grains. And the third, it would double. It would double again each and every single time marching across all 64 squares of the chessboard. Uh, well, okay, so let's take a look. And I think this is kind of, there's actually a number of points to this and I'll sort of make them as we go. So uh, here's the second day, two to the first. So we've made one transition. Two to the first is equal to two, of course, and then four and eight and 16 and 32. Now, this is actually um, the first time we can actually measure this. I didn't realize this until doing this, but uh, 64 grains of rice is about three eighths of a teaspoon. This, it's amazing how tiny grains of rice are. So this is actually not even a full teaspoon. This is a scant teaspoon, two to the seventh, 128 grains of rice. It's about three quarters of a teaspoon because in the next one, at 256, we get only half of a tablespoon. And I don't know how much you are up on your teaspoons and tablespoons, but there's three teaspoons in a tablespoon. So only on the night, um, this is now on the 10th square of the chessboard, the 10th iteration, after nine transitions, we get to a, a single tablespoon of rice, which incredibly has 500 grains of rice in it, which I find amazing. I really find that astonishing in a different way. On the eleventh uh, or tenth transition, tenth transition, eleven square, we get to a, an eighth of a cup of rice, a quarter cup of rice, a half of a cup of rice, a cup of rice, a pint of rice, and sort of you can zooming out here. This is a quart of rice. Here's a half gallon of rice. And guess by the way, uh, you can probably guess which household staple I panic bought in late March. Good, but this is about all the rice that I ended up getting a hold of. Um, so this continues by another 10 steps. This is about 1,500 pounds of rice. Another, uh, you know, after 31 steps, about halfway through the thing. This is a, just obviously a, a silly picture that I put together of a truck, a dump truck full of rice. After two to the 32nd, this is about 50,000 pounds of rice, as near as I can figure. This is a, meant to illustrate a normal house stuffed full of rice after two to the 34th or on the 35th space. And um, I just was trying to estimate what the volume of the house was and having worked out what the volume of an individual grain is, I can now say that roughly speaking two to the 35th is, two to the 34th is how many grains might fill a modest ordinary sized house. This is the Royal Albert Hall, and it turns out that it has 130,000 cubic feet stuffed full of rice. Now we know how many halls it takes to fill the Albert Hall. Here's the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. This is about twice the production of the annual production of the rice produced in Arkansas. So Arkansas produces about half of the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. So it would have been on the 46th day, 46th transition that we would have had 
a year's worth of Arkansas rice. This is the world's annual production of rice. In a cube that's about a kilometer across, you can see here, this is a Razorback Stadium down there. This is after 53. After 63, this is, this is the end of the chessboard. This is a cube five miles on a side. Um, this is actually easily, it's, it, I'm, I don't have figures, but I'm sure that this is more than the world historical production of rice over the entire eight or 9,000 years, simply because this is about 1,700 times the annual production now. And of course, production has increased tremendously over the last a century, certainly over the last, uh, since the so-called Green Revolution 50 years ago. And in fact, it gets worse. If we were able to continue this, exponential growth is so staggering that it just in another 12 steps, we get to the size of the earth. And another, if we want the Milky Way, 160 steps. If you want an entire universe, the 13 billion light year across sphere of the visible known universe, then we get there in another 80 steps after that, 280 steps altogether. Where do we start? Exponential growth is bizarre. And it's bizarre because it starts out in this kind of manner where it's below our threshold of, under, of perception. And then it rockets through the range of levels in which we actually are aware of what's going on. Really, the only meaningful, personally meaningful slides in the previous sequence were the ones that went from maybe a tablespoon or a teaspoon up through maybe, you know, my panic buying supply of rice, right? Every exponential curve has this property where it essentially looks pretty much flat and invisible to you. And then there's this brief time when it's sort of skyrocketing through your realm of the of perception, and then it's gone. It's absolutely gone out of, out of the realm of understanding. Um, let me give you another sort of counterintuitive example. This is a very easy example except I don't think it makes sense. I mean, it does make sense. It makes perfect sense, except that it doesn't. That's how this all sort of is. So here, suppose uh, you have this puzzle, and the puzzle is every day the amount of algae in a pond doubles, and the algae fills the pond in 15 days. So on what day does it fill half the pond? I mean, just take a moment, come up with your answer. It obviously fills half the pond on the day before the last day, right? I mean, you, you'd think of it's, but that's weird, right? I mean, you could have like nothing. And then all of a sudden, the very day before the end, you're halfway there. It's halfway full. And then it's totally full on the next day. Or let me put it another way that may be more striking. On what day is it, say, a tenth full? Well, it's a tenth full about a little more than three days before the end. On what day is it a hundredth full? It's a hundredfold, just a bit more than six days before the end. Um, I'd like to switch gears just a little bit to take you to this website. I think um, Luis is going to put the uh, link in the chat thing, so you don't have to uh, write this down. Here's uh, this little demo that I put together. Whoops. And um, I hope you will play with this. I'd like to just take a little bit moment to explain here's exponential growth. So first of all, here's a, here's what an exponential curve looks like. And, and as I said, it has this quality that at the beginning, it just looks like, sorry, at the beginning, let me just get this the way I want it. Okay. At the beginning, you just really see nothing at all. And then all of a sudden, it just races through the range of levels of perception that you might have of things that you might be interested in, and then it's gone. It's absolutely gone. The second thing I'd like to point out here is that all exponential curves look really exactly the same. So in this model, uh, you can change the rate at which, in this case, it's phrased in terms of infection, naturally, and you can change the amount of time shown on the screen. But see, if I change the amount of time, so I change the rate of infection, make it steeper or narrower, but then I change the time and it just looks the same as the other curve. I can make all of these look the same just by fiddling around with one or the other. I can change one of these sliders and then I can change the other slider to sort of counterbalance it. 
So all exponential curves have this appearance where they're essentially flat. There's some brief moment of transition and then it's out of the picture. I'd like to take just a second to say something about um, what this calculus -y stuff looks like, is about. Um, many of you have had, some of you have had calculus, some of you have not had calculus, but I just want to explain that this is as much a language as anything else. This isn't really saying as much as it might seem to be saying. So this, if P is the population, and it's a function of T, it's changing as you plug in different T's and you get different populations out, then this symbol here, the derivative, is just uh, uh, represents the rate of the growth. How fast is the population growing? And for exponential growth, it has this key property, which is the definitive property of exponential growth, is that the rate of growth is exactly some multiple, some constant times the size of the population growth. So this is, makes perfect sense in terms of, say, um, a breeding population. Every, say, an infectious population, every infected person will infect some other number of people. The more people are infected, the faster the rate of growth is growing. That's it. That's the entire thing that this equation is expressing. And there's a unique way to solve this thing up to various kinds of sliding the curve around, which is that it has to be of the form. And I'm not going to, this is not an, there's not enough time to explain why, where this K went and why there's B's here and so forth, but it's a different number raised to some power of T, possibly with some additional uh, shifting around. So in the case of the rice, every grain of rice effectively gave rise to another grain of rice at any given time. And second of all, the total number of grains of rice was two to some power, essentially. So um, that's basically what I have to say about that. Now, the second thing is, or the next thing is, um, what's really important is that the rate of growth matters critically much. In the rice example, if we went for, if we were doubling every day for a month, we got to a dump truck. But if I were doubling every week for a month, I would have only gotten to like 16 grains of rice, you see. So even though they're both exponential growth, in the real world, it's critically important. That time scale is hugely important to us. And just before I move on to the next slide, log plots are a good way to visualize this. So here's two exponential curves. And if I plot them, instead of plotting them where the height is just simply the raw number of things, if instead I do it in powers of, say, 10 or whatever, so I have one, it's the height is the number of zeros, so one, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on, then exponential curves simply become straight lines. Because notice that as the blue line's going up, at time two, it's, or let's say the orange one, at, this is, it's 10, 100, 1,000, it is going up exponentially, but it's easier to see this as a straight line. And now I come to one of the most important points of my talk. This is what it looked like on April 1st. Let me remind you that on March the 12th, when the university closed uh, very rapidly, this is hard to remember. It was already two months ago. And so on March the 12th, there were 1,025 confirmed cases in the United States. And by the way, the week before there were 200, so it was a jump by five. A week later, there were 6,500. So in one week, there were six times the number of cases. It was doubling almost every two days. A week after that, it had gone up by a factor of nine. A week after that, it was 200,000 almost, 190,000. You see, at the rate at which the cases were dub uh, were increasing at that time. If nothing been done, essentially everybody in the country would be infected right now. That is the meaning of the hammer. The severe social distancing that we did was precisely to, to put an end to this exponential growth. This chart is very amazing. This is from the, th this is, each of these lines is on a different, uh, starts at a different time. They're always starting at the time of the 30th case. And these slopes here are how fast, if something were doubling every day, it would be moving like this, be this slope. And in fact, you can see, for example, um, 
well, let's see. So doubling every two days would be a long, something parallel to this line. Whoops. Every three days, four days, and so on. At the time we were uh, two months ago, the United States was doubling more than every three days. You can see it's fast. It's steeper than this line here. That's the moment when that's probably, I guess that's probably about the um, third week of March was when that was happening. So um, it was frightening. It was really frightening. That's why people were so freaked out. On the first day, Dr. Thomas showed this chart, which was that, you know, that Northwest Arkansas could be inundated with like needing, you know, 5,000 ICU beds or whatever. I don't quite recall the exact number. That seems a bit, that was probably too high, but um, that was really the situation that we were looking at. Today, the situation looks like this. And this is very, very, very different. Notice that the United States now, the curve is about like this. That's essentially doubling, it's parallel roughly to this line. Right now, it seems like the number of cases in the United States is maybe doubling every 30 days, as opposed to every three days. And if you think back to the rice example, where would you rather be on the 10th square or the 30th square, say, or the 100th square? That's, that's the entire thing. So even though what I'm showing you is very reductionist and it's only the very beginning of epidemiology, this is the profound point that really underlies everything, is that we want to avoid, we want to um, lower these rates of exponential growth and hopefully diminish them. You'll see that, for example, South Korea, this is South Korea, has managed to basically be flat now for quite some time, as has China. However, this is troubling. The world is still, uh, has been doubling every seven days, which is still lower. I checked the data last night and was sort of looking at it. No country in the world is doubling at anything like the rates that we saw uh, six weeks ago. And that's because we're all under these severe um, lockdowns and semi-quarantine situations. So I'd like to just talk about, move to the next phase of the model. So this is exponential growth. That's not really realistic. So let me just describe this in another way. Let me just switch gears a little tiny bit. So exponential growth can't continue indefinitely. Here's an example with human, the human population. Human population has actually been growing slightly more than exponentially. There was a, it doubled over 130 years from 1800 to 1930. It doubled again in just 44 years, and we're close to doubling in another 46 years. Could we double again in, say, another 50 years? Well, I think it's obvious that there's some sort of natural carrying capacity to the Earth or to any environment in which something could be growing. We can't have a universe full of rice. We can't. The algae is ultimately bounded by the resources in the pond. And this is the UN estimates right as of uh, last year for the future growth. And notice in particular that the median estimate uh, involves us leveling, beginning to level off. And this brings us to the next model. So now I'm going to switch for good to my demo here. And I'd like to just talk about these other uh, examples. So this is the so-called logistics curve. And just the math of this, again, going back to this language, is, is pretty straightforward. It really is. See, the reason that you can't really grow forever is that you have, everyone can breed, every, the population can continue to um, you know, create new members of the population, but it's only, and so the rate of growth is proportional to the size of the population, but it's also proportional to the size of the resources that remain. So in particular, the rate of growth is both proportional to the size of the population and also what's left, the room into which the population can grow. And again, this K is just sitting there as some sort of uh, constant. And so logistics curves have this very straightforward appearance. They always look like this S. All logistics curves look the same. It's just a matter of fiddling around with um, the ratio between the days and the infectees. And, um, and they all have this appearance as the, the video that uh, the students in the class watched, the wonderful um, three blue, one brown series. They begin out by almost exponentially growing. And then they also have this furthermore, this exponential decay. It's a mirror image of the exponential growth on the other end. 
where you approach this. And then there's this so-called inflection point in the middle. We're really pretty much past the inflection point. One of the students asked that uh, as a question for this model. Now, there's another thing I should say here is that the R number has been talked about a lot and will be talked a lot about a lot. The R number here is infinite because nobody ever leaves the population. Once you're infected, you stay infected. You can continue to infect other people. And that's still um, not, uh, that may be like for the zombie apocalypse, that's going to be the way it goes down. But for the current one, it's not really that way at all, right? We People are infectious for a little while, and then they are no longer infectious. Um, so we should move to the next model, and this is pretty much where I'm going to end up, is a so-called compartmental model. And these are um, where, this is sort of where we begin to have slightly more sophisticated uh, understanding of what's happening. Now, this is a bit of, in, this is often called the SIR model, but for my own reasons, I couldn't call it that because eyes look really weird to me written in this way. So I called it, we have this, we have basically the population is divided into compartments. We have the susceptibles, the people that could be infected, the infected, and see I used N for infected, and the no longer infected, and I used R for, uh, well, the same, recovered. But they might not be recovered, depending on what we're, they could be dead, right? So we have, um, we basically, this model is simply this, that every single time you have the number of, the way that the uh, susceptible population is changing, it's decreasing. And how is it decreasing? Well, it's changing in the same as the, the, the um, oh, that's a mistake. That should be a darn, that should be an S. It's decreasing by the, it's proportional to the number of people that are infected and a number of people that are still remaining susceptible. It's just the logistics model, and this is a typo that should be an S. Whereas the number of people that are infected, it's the logistics model again. That's proportional to the number of people that are infected, and again, that's a typo, that should be an S, and to the number of people that remain susceptible. But at the same time, some proportion of people are recovering. At a steady rate, some fraction of the people, proportional to the number of people that are infected, are being removed from that population, and being added to the um, recovering population. Now, I'd like to just play around with this. These are some parameters for fooling around with this. If we have um, no recovery, we're just right back at the um, logistics model. But if we have some recovery, things change quite a bit. Now, these numbers here are just completely bogus. They have nothing to do with COVID. This is just to give you a sense of how these things can behave. But the critical thing here is to notice that if you have some recovery rate, notice that we don't eat up the entire population of susceptibles, that it levels off at some threshold below the susceptibles. Now, for this, perhaps this particular mix of parameters, or any particular mix of parameters, let's make a, what's happening is, is that there simply are, people are recovering faster than they can infect new people, that's it. At first, you have a lot of infected people, they're sweeping up there, but at this point here, you're simply not infecting people quickly enough to uh, continue to grow the population. This is my second major point about the current situation. We need, we don't have any control over these parameters. The only, except one, we have one, con we have control over this parameter of how many people are infecting other people. That's what social distancing is entirely about. And by changing this, we can change the total number of people that are infected or not infected. Like even, right, so here, whoops, if we, that's too few. If, see, notice that by changing the number of people that are infecting each other, or infecting others, we can lower or raise this total um the total number of people infected. That's the goal. That's what the public policy, health policy mission has been for the last eight weeks. That's why we have this severe social distancing. Really, fundamentally, it's just that's the one thing we can control. And that's what we're trying to do. One last thing. Here I'm showing cumulative, uh, cumulative 
uh, numbers, not the daily numbers. So what is it that we're trying to do with the hospitals? The hospitals, the whole idea is that we want to keep the size of the red band as thin as possible. Not as thin as possible, but definitely below the um, below the capacity of hospitals to treat. With a thick red band, we're in trouble. So with a thick red band, we are really seriously in trouble. Like this would be catastrophic for us. And again, this is the kind of thing, the only thing we can control is basically this middle slider. Finally, uh, just let me wrap up by saying two more things, uh, just this. So if we have the uh, mortality, it doesn't really change anything. It just simply is another little thing. Notice nothing else is moving. The mortality is just simply dividing the uh, non-infectious into two compartments, the dead and the recovered. So, but then lastly, and this is where I'll stop, Everything I've shown you is what's called a toy model. And real models, real epidemiologists have to, I mean, it's a huge complex thing and there really isn't a fully, it's not fully understood. So I'm not taking into account the num length of time that ind individuals are contagious, obviously vastly varying social and geographic conditions, which Dr. Sui will talk about, the mobility or isolation of populations that these are actually not like fixed numbers over an entire population, but that every individual, it's more like rolling some dice for millions and millions of times. And above all, we don't have the data. I mean, we just don't have the data yet. I mean, this will be, a, there'll be a post-mortem models, uh, so to speak, which will be very, very good, but really public health officials are doing this all to the best they can, to some extent flying blind. And that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. Okay, so Louise? Yeah, do you want me to pop it up? Okay, hold on. <clears throat> Let me give it one more try from my end. I have my, uh, this is a part of the Microsoft team. I have it open. When I try to share it, uh, I didn't see it. Just like uh, uh, what happened to uh, uh, Haim. I didn't, okay, I, I see it now. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, now we are in business. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, thank Dean Kuhn for her strong leadership and her entire team at Honors College at the University of Arkansas for putting such a, a wonderful uh, pandemics forum together in such a uh, a challenging time with a, such a, a short notice. Uh, it's a great teamwork, and I've, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, instructional team to share, um, you know, what from my disciplinary background and uh, my training, and um, um, and I'm although I only sit in partially uh, two uh, uh, two and a half lectures so far, but I'm really impressed by the breadth and depth of the uh, coverage we have more exciting talks to uh, uh, forthcoming and uh, just uh, i think uh, what a professor uh, good mastras just talked about is a perfect setup for what i'm going to uh, share with you uh, today uh, so just uh, uh, to begin with i uh, Dr. Uh, Goodman Strauss mentioned that mathematics is uh, 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 very reductionist. He may be a little bit too modest, but uh, I want to uh, uh, alert you that geography is uh, at the other end of um, the spectrum. As an intellectual pursuit, geography is, in many ways is uh, like uh, uh, history. It's a still one uh, history. It's a, still one of the big tent. Uh, disciplines. We are trying to be very holistic 
using a map, mapping metaphor, we are trying to always trying to connect the dots. But based upon those uh, in-depth disciplinary uh, inquiries uh, uh, that experts in various uh, specialized field uh, are making. So to keep that in mind, uh, that will help you what I'm talking about today. So uh, <clears throat> here's uh, the general outline what I'm going to cover today. Let me warn you, this is going to be a very fast paced, uh, high level overview. And I'm going to uh, provide you plenty of information if you are interested in digging a little bit further. Uh, you're, you can, you are certainly welcome to do so. And also, we have a wonderful GIS uh, program in the Department of uh, uh, Geosciences here. You are, I would highly encourage you if this is something you are interested in pursuing. I would highly recommend you to take uh, some introductory level GIS and cartography class. So today. I'm going to give a very quick, a brief overview of uh, what exactly the role of maps and the mapping in understanding pandemics, and then switch over quickly to mapping COVID-19, what have been mapped and what we have learned so far. And uh, I will end my talk by sharing with you what do we go from here. Again, uh, my caveat is uh, it's just, uh, still an uh, evolving situation. I have used some of the uh, 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 most up-to-date real-world data, but uh, it's it's tentative. Let me pre premise my presentation that way. And things uh, might change, but this will give you an idea. You know uh, uh, where things are going and uh, how the the whole uh, area of maps and the mapping have helped us to understand the the situation, the current crisis. So. Just very briefly, the topic I'm covering today is uh, broadly related to the a subtopic in uh, a medical geography or the, more specifically the cartography of diseases. So, you know, humans have used the maps so long before we use uh, uh, languages. We have a long history of using uh, maps to understand the disease. And it's uh, in terms of uh, uh, mapping of disease uh, and uh, uh, health related issues is all started uh, with this map uh, made uh, around 1854 by this uh, medical doctor John Snow. He's uh, considered as the founding father of uh, uh, modern epidemiology. So this is a very famous map uh, started all the 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 business that we know uh, as today as a uh, uh, medical uh, uh, mapping. It's about the cholera break in London, uh, uh, you know, uh, around May 19th century. Very detailed map household. He did a lot of survey, door to door interview, and then he put everybody on uh, uh, on the map like this. So finally, he because there were two competing theories at that point. The lots of debates in among the public health officials in the city of London. So finally, after this map was made able to locate this water pump. You know, it's uh, triggered, this cholera outbreak was, uh, um, uh, you know, triggered by people, you know, uh, drawing water from this uh, water pump in London. And then what, after the city of London decided to shut down this water pump, you know, they stopped the uh, cholera outbreak in London. So this is a, a fascinating story. If you're interested, I would highly recommend you to take a look at uh, uh, Steve Johnson's uh, bestseller, New York Times bestseller, The Ghost Map, about the story of the <clears throat> John Snow's cholera map. But so the for most recent epidemics, I think uh, if you have paid attention, you know, maps and the mapping have always been part of uh, um, the communication scheme about uh, uh, a recent uh, um, uh, global pandemic, starting with the 2003, uh, the SARS outbreak, and then uh, 2016 Ebola, and then the 2015-16 Zika uh, 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 virus. So I understand that most of you may not be uh, familiar in a technical sense of how those uh, maps are made. Map making it has changed a lot since John Snow's days. So these days, uh, you know, to make a map is uh, a pretty long te uh, technical process involving these steps as shown uh, uh, here. You start with data collection, and after you have done your data collection, usually 
some sort of a statistical analysis or mathematical modeling have to be done. And then based on those results and the, your data you collected, you design maps and they evaluate how the, is the situation. Then you communicate with you, the maps you are making to make all different kinds of uh, 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 decisions. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, data, you know, we uh, in terms of mapping skills right now, Mapping, we can do it from based upon the DNA sequencing data from genetic to individual, all the way to local, regional, all the way to global level, and everything in between. In, instead of uh, in, uh, including using um, health metrics data collected at the in individual level, indoor uh, uh, mapping, and uh, from genetic to really global but in terms of who are doing uh, the, the, the the maps i think that also has changed a lot it used to be a, this is a pretty used to be a pretty specialized field you have to get some credentials to uh, do the map correctly but not anymore the learning curve has been uh, uh, flattened so dramatically during the past 20 years so in addition to the professional trained cartographers cartographers Everybody now can make a nap by a few clicks. Uh, as you can imagine, that uh, uh, um, you know, some uh, lots of people. At the best, but based on my assessment, is lots of people know enough uh, to make uh, a map and uh, to make them believe they are right. But uh, they are lots of amateur mappers. Uh, do not know enough that they realize, uh, fully realize the maps they are making could be very misleading or sometimes uh, flatly wrong. So keep that in mind because uh, how to interpret maps uh, will be a very important part in terms of uh, uh, what kind of decision we are making. So without getting into the details, I want to uh, alert you maps uh, maybe a cliche to some of you is not the territory. So if it's not the territory, what it is, then it's a representation. OK, it's a representation based upon of all different kinds of uh, conceptual, statistical, mathematical, theoretical models. So to understand maps, you have to understand exactly how the, the conceptual, statistical, mathematical models are embedded in the entire mapping process. So that is uh, talking about data. Here's another caveat. You probably, some of you have heard Mark Twain Sullivan's quote that there are lies, the lies and the statistics. And there's a, a very popular book in the late 50s, late 50s called How to Lie with Statistics by a very well-known statistician, Daryl Hoff. And my colleague, uh, the Syracuse Mark, uh, Professor Mark Mamonia, inspired by this book, actually, he wrote a book called How to Live with Maps. And I have uh, alerted you uh, to uh, have a look at, quick look at this uh, uh, book, because that will give you, uh, empower you with some healthy skepticism, skepticism in terms of uh, when you are bombarded with all these uh, sometimes very glitzy visuals uh, maps. So um, so another way to look at uh, uh, maps is probably you have heard uh, lots of experts were saying all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So to paraphrase that, I have to say all maps can be misleading, but uh, some maps uh, can help us uh, to move us uh, move from point A to B. So with those caveats now, let's uh, shift uh, uh, gears uh, to uh, um, to some uh, of the COVID-19 uh, mapping uh, efforts. So the good, there are lots of sites out there. So the good place to start is uh, uh, um, the ESRI's uh, website. For those of you who are not familiar with the mapping in the GIS business, this is uh, a multi-billion dollar industry and the ERSRI is the dominant player. So all the maps uh, that, uh, as far as I can tell, that are made by people across 
the globe, but most of the maps, I would estimate somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of the maps are made, are made using the software tools called ArcGIS, developed by ESRI. So they um, have developed a very comprehensive resource uh, uh, page at the ESRI uh, website. And um, maps uh, have been uh, mapped at a different scales by all different kinds of players. Let's start it with uh, uh, WHO. Uh, they have a dashboard. Uh, again, it's uh, updated uh, 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 daily, uh, sometimes hourly, depending on the situation. So uh, in the US CDC at the national level, they have uh, uh, a website for COVID-19. Uh, the Arkansas Department of Health has its own uh, uh, website at the county uh, uh, level. You know, the in terms of academia, one of the most frequently refers to the dashboard is uh, uh, this one uh, maintained, developed by uh, uh, the Center for System Science and Engineering at John Hopkins. Actually, it's maintained by two PhD students. Again, the driver, uh, uh, the mapping tool behind this is ArcGIS. Um, and uh, another one that I really like is the uh, Spatial Temporal uh, Computing Center at George Mason, because the, the, the maps that they are using, the database they co collected are quite uh, sophisticated, as shown here in, uh, you know, so in terms of the spread in the US, that they use the, some very specific, uh, a sophisticated mapping technique called decimetric mapping involves uh, quite a complicated uh, spatial interpolation. I don't have time to get into the detailed methodological details, but if you're curious, uh, I can help you uh, with that uh, during Q&A or uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's uh, uh, small group discussion. So, uh, and also most of the media outlet from New York Times to uh, CNN have used the maps in their website to communicate what's going on. I believe the New York Times map is the one that uh, uh, Dr. Thomas used the, in his lecture uh, on Monday. This is uh, actually one of the uh, most accurate, uh, uh, elegantly um, designed maps I have seen by uh, the, the media outlet. Um, so, in terms of, uh, uh, in addition to mapping the cases and the spread of COVID-19, the uh, CDC has also been mapping the vulnerable uh, population uh, based upon the social vulnerability index, uh, considering multiple gender, social, economic, and uh, um, uh, 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 you, you know other race, uh, ethnicity factors. So this is the situation uh, in the U.S. And in addition to uh, the vulnerable of, of, uh, population, we uh, multiple people have also been really using the data available, mapping our healthcare capacity depending on the situation we are in. So this is the map showing you the uh, uh, the map of lessons the in the across the U.S. And um, uh, so just uh, a continuation of uh, uh, what Dr. Goodman Strauss had just talked about it based upon a very sophisticated mapping in terms of our healthcare uh, uh, capacity is this uh, m model developed uh, uh, by University of uh, uh, Pennsylvania folks. Uh, it's called uh, COVID-19 Hospital Impact Model for Epidemics, so-called Chime, chime model. So it's uh, uh, used to make a hospital surge capacity forecasting. So again, this is based upon mathematical simulation uh, uh, using lots of data hosted by the Institute of Health Metrics at the University of Washington. Uh, the good news is uh, if you look at the, the data that, that the, this mapping exercise, what they revealed, uh, the state of Arkansas is doing great. So we have, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, eight uh, total of eight thousand beds, hospital license, the hospital beds uh, uh, ready, and uh, even based upon the worst case scenarios, we will be using only fifteen to twenty percent of our. Uh, capacity. So that's really great for the citizens of Arkansas. And the good news is we are 
you, you, you know, they uh, uh, keep, uh, uh, um, uh, you, you know, flattening the curve. So, so let me just qu quickly summarize uh, in terms of what have been mapped so far. So there are generally speaking five categories. So we uh, some simple maps uh, uh, refer uh, covered some mapping this uh, uh, infection cases and also map have been used to track the spread. And we have also mapped a vulnerable population and mapping capacity in terms of uh, our preparedness and the response. And the last, not need, least, is uh, synthesis of all the four, uh, uh, four, four types of maps and that we have used a, a variety of uh, uh, types to communicate with uh, the general public uh, what's uh, uh, really going on. So uh, I must say that uh, uh, Dr. Jason Tulis uh, is a uh, uh, Enterprise multi-user GS class uh, also posted uh, this website is uh, uh, at ArcGIS a story map website. It's uh, uh, a story map developed uh, by uh, students in Dr. Tulis class about COVID-19 resources in E4 Northwest Arkansas. So I'm really proud about uh, our students' work in using the mapping tools informing the public what's going on in our region. So uh, so before we I turned into my next topic, let me just uh, dive uh, a little bit uh, deeper into uh, some of the more sophisticated mapping. This is a map showing uh, how the, you know, the seven strand of a virus. We, as you learned from Dr. Newton's lecture, we are interested in the uh, uh, three of the seven SARS COVID-2 virus. And this is uh, uh, based upon the genetic sequencing, you know, globally, how they are distributed and how they have been uh, uh, moved around. Um, so as a, a geographer, you know, we have been studying the people's uh, 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 flow and travel pattern for quite some time. So one thing, uh, changed dramatically since uh, you know since 1500 up to now is the time space convergence. So think about this. Uh, you know we use when we travel on horse-drawn coaches in the sailing boat, we move uh, about 10 miles an hour. If you are try traveling on Boeing's 777, it's uh, five to 700 miles per hour. So in terms of uh, how people travel. Uh, around the globe but during the past uh, 200 years it's reduced from uh, a, a year or two to a uh, couple of weeks and right now less than 24 hours so we can circle the globe. What does that mean in terms of uh, virus? It means go, go you know as they say as people go so do the virus. So this is a I'll give you an idea of a global travel pattern. And so this, my next map show we give you an idea of how Americans are, are traveling on a typical day. So, and this is a, a map showing you the European uh, flight. Uh, so the, uh, in terms of uh, how this is the way Americans are waking up uh, there, uh, in terms of the flight at uh, uh, so understanding how the people's movement will be key in terms of understanding how COVID-19 has uh, traveled. And the um, graph on the right showed you uh, the spread of the vir virus uh, between uh, 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 China, Iran, and Italy and the two some of the other European countries. It's uh, uh, one of the best papers that just recently published uh, in science, uh, as you can see here, you know, what are the origin and destination of uh, uh, the, uh, the virus. And there are uh, also uh, uh, a another very sophisticated study in terms of the major uh, Chinese cities, uh, how people have traveled before the Wuhan shutdown uh, on January 22nd, and what's happened before, what had been happened after in terms of uh, uh, the global uh, spread of, uh, of the virus. So uh, 
Now let's uh, sh let me shift gears uh, to uh, talk about what what uh, has uh, uh, all have all these mapping efforts uh, uh, of COVID nineteen revealed uh, so far. So um, I have a couple points. Again, I do not have the time to get into it in great detail. First things revealed I want to put in, in your mind is uh, what the geographers called it the first law of geography. It's uh, spatial dependence. So the first law of geography says everything is related to everything else. And near things are probably are more closely related to distant things. Um, as I, I have come shown, you know, this is uh, due to the globalization and uh, all the people flow, information flow, and the money flow. You know, we uh, are in the global community is in this pandemic together. So spatial dependence is uh, the one of the most things, uh, 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 most important things that those maps about COVID-19 have revealed. Secondly. I think the um, uh, as they often say, they as the world shrinks, it also shrivels. What does that mean? It's the second aspect of uh, what those uh, COVID-19 mapping efforts have revealed, that is spatial heterogeneity. To translate it into medical geography terminology, I think it uh, revealed the great health disparity. It's really, let me just, uh, in case my key message got lost, let me just say in terms of health disparity, it's a lay bare, the great health disparity from local to the global level. I think COVID-19 uh, mapping has revealed. And the, uh, the Pope even mentioned this is the, the moment uh, for the global community to see the poor really in a very great, you know, intimate uh, 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 detail. So in terms of how disparity, we can examine it from geography at a global level, across the geographic scale, across the social economic uh, uh, status, especially the, the gigantic gap between the rich and poor, according to gender, age, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Last but not least the vulnerable population in terms of uh, homelessness uh, and also those in prison inmates. You know, they are all uh, being deeply impacted, impacted by um, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, many, uh, many countries um, in a, uh, uh, including, my, uh, you know, all the states in the United States have issued uh, uh, shelter at home uh, order or stay at home order. But uh, to lots of people, to the homeless people, they do not have a home. You know, in the United States, we have uh, uh, 69,000 uh, um, uh, homeless people. In New York City alone, I think they have 22,000 homeless people. You know, they potentially be, uh, uh, you know, think about the suffering of uh, uh, the homeless folks under the COVID-19, so, and including the 400 homeless people in Northwest uh, Arkansas. But this is a very caring community, and uh, I'm uh, very pleased uh, uh, to observe that uh, most of the homeless people in our region are very well taken care of. But let me just, uh, again, this is a very fluid sit situation. I do not have all the data at the global level, I should. But let me just share with you the in the United States, in terms of a health disparity, the data I do have available. Again, this is a, a dynamic situation. It has been called by some public health officials as uh, a crisis within the crisis. That is uh, African-Americans uh, face uh, uh, suffering disproportionately in terms of uh, COVID uh, uh, deaths. So look at those uh, the the states I have shown uh, in this bar chart. Louisiana, in terms of African American population, 32 percent, but their share of COVID-19 deaths 70 uh, 70 percent. And the Illinois, so uh, Michigan, if you look at North Carolina. So in other words, the uh, a COVID death for African many, uh, African American communities are twice as their percentage of the uh, state pop 
state or city population we are talking about. So, uh, so this is a really uh, 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 not another uh, awakening moment about uh, uh, the health disparities within the United States and also the global level. So, we, in terms of another important things that revealed. Uh, as a geographer, I'm keenly concerned about uh, the sustainability, the impact of global climate change. So, and here's uh, uh, one mapping effort uh, that revealed the dramatic environmental impacts uh, under COVID-19 lockdown in terms of air quality index in China. You know, think about, look, look at uh, 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 its index in January, uh, on January 15, before the lockdown and the, 23rd is the lockdown and just take a look at three weeks later, you know, what a dramatic change. So it's, uh, again, the data is incomplete, but according to uh, one estimate in terms of greenhouse uh, gas e emissions, uh, you know, the uh, COVID-19 lockdown has reduced the global greenhouse gas emissions uh, by around at least the seven percent. Again, it varies uh, from continent to continent, from country to country. If you think about uh, the uh, United Nations uh, uh, sustainability, uh, um, you know, a recommendation in terms of uh, uh, or the greenhouse emission expectations, they are expecting, you know, from, from now on, if we reach we, if we plan to reach the goal by 2030, each country has to plan to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emission by seven and a half percent. But the COVID-19 shutdown will give you, uh, uh, give us, all of us, uh, uh, some sort of a reference point in terms of what is realistic, what is unre unrealistic. So, but in terms of environmental impact, I think there are a lot of uh, things that we need to ponder about. So moving forward, what do we go from here? Um, the dream in the medical community is uh, uh, really uh, the precision medicine uh, based on DNA sequencing. And um, and for the last couple of years, I have been part of the team really working uh, on the, this paradigm called the precision public health. So especially in the context of fighting pan infectious pa pandemic, uh, 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 diseases. Uh, but this would, to implement the ideas of a precision public health, it would require uh, four T, meaning uh, testing, tracing, tracking, and ultimately treatment. So moving forward, let me, um, we are still uh, a bit far away from uh, uh, the precision public health uh, paradigm, but in the short term, I, I, based upon what uh, uh, we have done and what we know, I'm cautiously, cautiously optimistic that we will uh, win, you know, our current fight against COVID-19. But the challenge is how far do we want to go? Uh, and that's a really uh, complicated uh, uh, issue. So it's way beyond the biomedical science or the technical uh, technical realm. So this is uh, what uh, I think Dr. Hammond mentioned this a little bit uh, yesterday. This is what's happening in um, China. You know, uh, uh, a cell phone app, everybody has uh, to sign in and use, and the government is tracking it down wherever you go. Even a drone on the street for drivers, you have to scan in that barcode to get a green pass to enter a city to drive around, or like in this customer, he got a, a red. That means that he won't be able to uh, take uh, the subway because he need to start the quarantine. So in uh, South Korea, a similar tracking, uh, cell phone based tracking tool uh, with uh, people's uh, real geographical coordinates uh, 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 revealed has been used, required uh, by all citizens. And uh, the map they are using, this is the closest uh, COVID-19 map I can find 
that are close closest to John Snow's map in terms of in terms of granularity and the detail at the address level uh, in terms of where people live, where they go uh, 24 seven. And uh, if you ask me why South Korea is doing so well in terms of contain, uh, containing COVID-19, uh, in addition to the extensive testing, I think uh, tracing tracking is also played a very important role. The UK is uh, developing a similar tool and it's already shown some of the uh, uh, the effect. Some of you have uh, uh, seen, uh, uh, read in the news that the Google and uh, uh, Apple are keeping up. Microsoft, by the way, uh, uh, according to uh, one of my former students working at Microsoft, Microsoft has already developed uh, uh, some uh, COVID-19 tracking tool. But the big thing is uh, this work currently being done by Google and Apple. It's a uh, and as expected, it raises a lot of privacy concerns. Um, so due to the mounting public pressure, I think they are going to do uh, it only Bluetooth based and uh, uh, it's voluntary uh, program. Um, so let's see. I think this will be very helpful once uh, everybody start downloading, although on a voluntary basis, it's still better than uh, the current tracing method that we have. So. But this is again raises a issue related to uh, surveillance and the civil liberties. Uh, by the way, this is a, another area of my research. I have devoted a lot of time thinking about this issue in terms of uh, surveillance. We we are really into a surveillance as a society um, from local to global. You know, those uh, surveillance uh, technologies are very sophisticated, multi-sensor, multi-platform, multiple sphere. If you think about the internet of things, uh, everything we do online, when you are putting a, your thumb on your cell phone, you left uh, a trace in cyberspace, uh, somebody somewhere is tracking uh, what you are doing and uh, synthesizing the data. That's a part of uh, the, the global digital economy or the age, we are in the age of uh, uh, um, surveillance capitalism. So shortly after 11, uh, 9 11, you know, we uh, reorganized the federal government in uh, response to Homeland Security issues. And the DARPA vision was uh, to create an office within DHS called Total Information Awareness. As you can imagine, that had triggered a uh, lot of public anxiety. So under uh, the public mounting pressure, the Office of Total Information Awareness uh, did not uh, uh, got implemented. But now under COVID-19, there are some resume conversations. Uh, should we resume our data collection effort to have uh, total information awareness in the context of uh, fighting global infectious disease like COVID-19. Um, we have the technical capabilities to do it, but is that the route we want to go? And where is the balance? And the, uh, if you ask a Google, you know, the co-founder Sergey Brin said, the perfect search engine should be like the mind of God. And there's a, this cartoon in terms of what you will be able to Google, uh, you know, it, you, what you would be able to search using Google search engine. It's uh, uh, in, con in connection to George Orwell's 1984. But uh, what uh, most people are really afraid of uh, is the implementation of what uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, envisioned, the Panopticon. You know, that's a prison. You have uh, somebody in society that are watching you all the time, but they are seeing you but without being seen. So with all things considered, this is a uh, lots of uh, some of the privacy advocates are, are afraid of. We are entering an electronic uh, version of Panopticon and that uh, 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 will create a new politics, new power dynamics, and power differentials. So. I want to just want to lay out uh, that uh, scenario to for you to think about when we are th thinking about fighting COVID-19. 
and versus uh, balancing privacy and uh, civil liberty concerns. So uh, here's a quick uh, up uh, musings uh, uh, in terms of a COVID-19 world. Uh, it's not going to be business as usual. Nobody knows for sure what's going to happen yet, but I do know with some certainty is it's a fundamental change of the human condition. And we have to think uh, this is a, a reckoning moment for hu humanity, for human history. And we have to think about broadly and deeply who we are, what we are doing, how we are conducting our life, especially uh, in terms of uh, animal virus transmission from uh, the natural world to human world. And also think about uh, the global climate change because uh, with the global uh, trends toward uh, uh, global climate change, you know, those uh, increasingly, those uh, uh, animal habitats uh, are de being destroyed. And those uh, animal viruses, 70% of the viruses uh, are transmitting. We, we are going to have a lecture on this. I'm so glad to see that. So are cl getting closer, closer to uh, 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 human. So, uh, and also I inspired by uh, Dr. Tracy Godess talk at uh, UA last uh, um, last week. I'm really uh, 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 inspired by her vision of the whole health, not to just think about the disease, but to think about uh, 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 a proactive health system to encourage, empower individuals to do the self care and in addition to the professional care and treatment, but also involving community at a various level to really ponder how we should conduct our lives in a way that gave us uh, a higher purpose and a, a deeper meaning in terms of who we are. So um, so with that, uh, that, I want to end my talk by giving you a plug of what I will be doing in the spring of uh, uh, um, 2021. Uh, it's also a pressing issue for uh, uh, in the co post the COVID-19 world. That is what it means to work uh, in the future. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a before COVID-19 increasing use of robotics or, uh, uh, has already been uh, widely uh, uh, discussed. I know restaurants are open in Arkansas. So in case you are curious, but, but we are required to wear masks. Uh, in, in case you are curious, uh, how do we eat with masks on? I do have a solution. Um, so the Japanese has invent, invented this uh, zipper mask. So you you can eat uh, at the restaurant with your mask on. So in case you need a haircut, but are concerned about social distancing, I do want to let you know that uh, um, uh, robots uh, now can be trained. That's a major accomplishment uh, in artificial intelligence. Uh, so, and uh, think about this. In the city of Xi'an, uh, uh, a robotic dentist uh, by is uh, can, put, can put a 3D printed teeth. Uh, think about that. So, so the future of healthcare. This is uh, we are. This is the world we are entering. So, uh, so maybe we that if this is implemented, maybe we can give the frontline nurses, doctors a break because they are humans as well. They are every day. They are risking their lives uh, to, in order to uh, save other people's lives. Uh, but the, again, this is uh, there are lots of issues that we need to to uh, think about. So regardless of what's going to happen, the driver of my research has always been to make the world more efficient, make our society more equitable, and make uh, the environment more sustainable. So I would like to end my quote with uh, 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 a historian, one of my favorite uh, historians, Yavil no, Harari at, uh, uh, in Israel. He published an article. Uh, he Gave, literally gave us two scenarios. Will we travel down the route of disunity or will we adopt the path of global solidarity? If we choose disunity, this will not only prolong the crisis, 
but it will probably result in even worse catastrophes in the future. However, if we choose global solidarity, it will be a victory not only to, you know, to uh, uh, win the coronavirus, but also against all future pandemics and crises that may uh, uh, challenge humankind in, in the 21st uh, uh, century. So uh, uh, I want to warn, uh, uh, you, you know, of the, uh, those attending today, uh, I'm not a very a big fan of the war metaphors used because uh, uh, they are going to, trap us thinking into a particular way that can be uh, 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 very uh, dangerous. So I, to summarize uh, the message I want to, the, my take home message, I want to um, uh, quote Dr. Martin Luther King for, from the letter uh, he sent from a Birmingham jail. He said, it really boggles down to this, this. All life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of a destiny. Whatever affects one destiny affects us all indirectly. I cannot find a better way to say that that's the first law of geography. With that, I, would, I will stop right there for Q&A. Thank you all. Well, thank you, well, thank very, you very much. much. Dr. Dr. Sri, Sri and Dr. 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 Strauss, I love how you're engaging our first two um, panels. That was great. And the beauty and artistry of mathematics, so beautifully visualized by Dr. Hyam Strauss. And uh, all the social justice issues that Dr. Sui raises and the surveillance tying in very nicely with Dr. Hammond's lecture yesterday. Wow. A lot to think about.